From The Times and The Sunday Times, this is The Story. I'm Manveen Rana. For weeks now, people who work in Westminster have been receiving messages out of the blue from someone who claims to know them. It goes a bit like this. Charlie messages a senior Labour politician on the 9th of October 2023 during the Labour Party conference. Charlie says, Are you at conference this year, man? We'll be great to finally meet. It's Charlie, by the way. I'd send you a reminder pic, but you probably shouldn't open something like that in public. Wink face. The politician replies to say they are at conference. Charlie says, Ah, it would be good to see you at some point. About time we had some fun. Wink face. The politician says they hope they're not being rude, but how do I know that we know each other? Charlie replies, We spoke on Bumble just after conference last year. Nothing major, but I sent a few pics. I won't be offended if you don't remember. How's your conference going? Are you still out? The following day, Charlie messages again. Have I embarrassed myself with popping up? Do you need a aubergine emoji pic for context? Ha. Huh. After a prolonged gap, Charlie messages again at the end of March. Still up, question mark. Can show you one thing I'm up to, eyes emoji, and a view only once picture. Too naughty, he writes. The story today. The Great Honey Trap. Sexting in Westminster. My name is Aubrey Allegretti. I'm The Times' chief political correspondent, and I've been here for about five months, so I'm honoured to finally be on this podcast. Hurrah. (laughs) I've been working on a story for around a week or so regarding the Westminster honeypot person who's been behind these slightly strange sexts to MPs and other senior politicians and staffers working with the investigations reporter Billy Kember. I've been leading on the sort of political elements of this. Billy has been doing lots of magical things behind the scenes to try and dig up more information on those that we suspect could be associated or behind this Harry Potter plot. Well, welcome to the podcast. What a story to start on. Tell us, how did you first hear that somebody had been sending sexts around Westminster? How did you first hear about the story? My job is to really spend all day asking people what's going on, effectively speaking to MPs and just saying, what's getting you frustrated today? What's on your agenda? What's coming up? Anything interesting going on? The usual sort of exchange of gossip. And I wasn't targeted by this person. I know there were two political journalists who were, but unless you were targeted, it was quite hard to hear about it. And so the first I knew anything of the Honey Trapper was when Politico broke the story on Tuesday last week. And they revealed initially that I think about half a dozen sort of MPs and staffers had been targeted. And that really opened the door to a flood of other people coming forward who recognised both the names of the accounts that were being used and the types of messages that were being sent in order to lure people in. Then what did you do, having heard that this might be happening? How do you go about finding out what's really been going on? Well, Westminster is is a bubble which is cliche to say, but in a a situation like this, as soon as that first report had come out, everyone suddenly started talking about it. And unbeknownst to me, one or two people who had been targeted by the person who called themselves Charlie had been working secretly to try and uncover who this person was. So for a period of days in March, they spoke to each other, formulated a plan to effectively called Charlie's bluff and challenged him and told Charlie that they knew what he was doing and they weren't going to be fooled by it and they would go to the police unless he stopped. And Charlie responded, giving the impression of seemingly a sort of frightened young man who was saying he'd got out of his depth, was sort of playing with fire and had realised he'd got burnt and he didn't want to disgrace any MPs. And so he promised that he would stop. And that was where 
for the the small band of people who were investigating this over the last few weeks who were targeted, the story ended until the first report emerged and others started coming forward. It had been talked about, I suppose, very quietly in Westminster. So I was told that two people, two MPs, even discussed it in the House of Commons division lobbies, effectively warning the other person, if you get a message from somebody pretending to be called Charlie, watch out. Wow. So even though people were very reluctant to talk about it, a small band of them did and had already started, before the story came out, had started trying to do something about it. Then the story comes out. Where do you go? The situation we were in was knowing that there were at least six, but a growing number of people who were targeted from many different fields of Westminster. You've got MPs, you've got former MPs, you've got staffers. There's even reported to be a manager of an all-party parliamentary group. And I suppose the rationale, the motive, remains still quite unclear. But I spoke to some of those who'd been targeted. I called my contacts, um, asked them if they knew anyone who'd been affected and eventually managed to find several people who had. And it transpired that in the course of trying to press this Charlie on who they were and how they got MPs' numbers, that they said that they had interned for William Rack, the Conservative MP. And that was the first sort of red flag. And then on further investigation, those people still in touch with Charlie asked, why are you doing this? And Charlie said that William Rag had sort of put him up to it, that he was providing the phone numbers. And wow. that Charlie himself was doing the messaging. And it was at that point where I felt like I had enough evidence to confront William Rag. Now tell me about that, because you managed to get the, the scoop on this story, really. You, you managed to speak to William Rag about it. Tell us about that conversation. How did that go? William Rag, I think, knew that I was going to call because... I believe that the people that I'd spoken to had told him that they were speaking to me as well. Mm. And so he he knew that an approach was likely. When I rang him, he was audibly upset, distressed, and full of repentance for what had happened, but also wanted to get across that he had felt like a victim in all this, that he had given this Charlie person, some pictures of him when they'd been speaking on the app Grinder, and that William was concerned Charlie would have a hold over him. He said that he was put under enormous amounts of pressure by this Charlie person to provide the phone numbers, sometimes within as little as a minute. So Charlie would message and say, you know, in the next 60 seconds, I need this, according to Will. And that is the sort of pressure that William Rag describes being under and feeling the need to follow Charlie's instructions effectively. And you say he was filled with remorse. He had handed out the private phone numbers of fellow MPs, of other people in the Westminster circle, and felt bad about that now. Did he provide you with any evidence of, you know, the sort of threats he was facing if he didn't, or the kind of process of blackmail that was going on? There was no evidence provided, partly because a lot of their conversations seemed to have been conducted on this app Mm. and effectively when the first story broke that gave a warning to this Charlie person to delete their profile and with that it sort of deletes all of the history that is the issue that some people who You've been speaking to a lot of people in Westminster since all of this happened. Tell us about some of the conversations you've had with people who were contacted by Charlie, or we should say by Charlie or Abby, mm. as as this person sometimes appeared as. Yeah, that's one of the sort of the more curious elements of this is that they appeared to have two different guises. There are basically two different personas, Charlie and Abby, and they message from different phone numbers. They have different WhatsApp profile pictures. But then the curious thing about Charlie is that that seems to have been presented as being both a man and a woman. 
So a sort of gender neutral name, if you like, which allowed the, the sender to have a WhatsApp picture of a man and a woman having dinner together and being uh-huh. able to pull off both personas at once. So you wouldn't be sure which. Exactly. So yes, speaking to MPs who were targeted by this, there seems to be a a common formulation, which is effectively the sender trying to engage this person in immediately very overly friendly and chatty conversation. And I think exploiting that Westminster is full of minute connections, Mm. i.e. people meeting each other very fleetingly, often in the parliamentary bars or at events or just in the Houses of Parliament. And therefore, it is completely reasonable that a lot of people might have someone's number, but you might not immediately be able to remember them. It also plays on something very British, which is that if somebody seems very familiar, you're often embarrassed to admit you don't know who they are. Absolutely, yes. And and looking at some of the transcripts of these message exchanges, you do really see that shine through, that a lot of those targeted sort of had that slightly, I don't know, British Hugh Grant reply, where they were like, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, I'm trying to place you, you know. Do just help me, please. I'm sure. I'm sure I'll remember. Just jog my mind. Or they play along. <laughs> or they play along. Exactly. So effectively, Charlie would contact people and quickly move the the subject along to subjects like sex and relationships. But if people didn't respond, it was normally like, "Whoops, did I go too far?" Or he'd leave it and then check back in another couple of days and just say, "Hey, how are things?" I was very taken aback by some of the messages that referred to. MPs, constituencies, and suggesting that Charlie or Abby were going to be in the area and asking if they were going to be around. It does show that there was effort gone to to tailor the messages to take specific people in. I haven't been able to verify this, but one of the staffers who was allegedly targeted, there was reference to a breakup that they'd experienced several years ago. So wow. that was the sort of the formulation of all of the messages that followed a pattern and people responded in different ways. So some MPs immediately blocked the sender. Other people sort of entertained the conversation for a longer period of time and perhaps responded to Charlie's more sort of desperate entreaties to just keep the conversation going, but didn't rise to his attempts to move the conversation into uncomfortable areas. There were obviously people who were taken in by this. William Rag says he was one of them, but there are at least two other MPs who went on with it for long enough that they believed Charlie was genuine and provided pictures of their own back, which were explicit. And I spoke to another person who's a sort of political figure, if you like, who said that they realised that Charlie was not a real person or account back in October 2023 and warned others who they thought might fall victim to this and said that he was pretty but dangerous. So Pretty but dangerous. Yes. And presumably this is done in order to be able to blackmail people at a later date or control them in some way. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we've never really seen evidence that Charlie or Abby have explicitly blackmailed people. The closest we've got is William Ragg saying that he feared that that was what could happen. But another piece of the jigsaw is why exactly did they do this apart Mm. from just their own potential sort of sexual thrills? Now, William Ragg hasn't spoken since you got hold of him. Did you get a sense from him of how many people's numbers he had given or how many others might have been contacted? I didn't get the sense that William Ragg could remember exactly whose numbers he had given out, which suggests to me that this was not just one or two. Now, obviously, one of the big missing pieces of the jigsaw is who he was giving these to, Mm. because it seems as though...
So, Aubrey, you've managed to speak to William Rag. You've broken the scoop of how this scam was being conducted. You've spoken to lots of people in Westminster who've been contacted or have worried about it. You start to get a sense of the person behind the scam, Charlie, Abby, whatever they're called. How do you then go about finding out who they are? Talk us through it. Where do you begin? Where do you begin to find the culprit? I've watched a lot of Death in Paradise, and it did start to feel a little (laughs) bit like that moment where they put four or five pictures up on the whiteboard and they sort of run through the names, the faces, the relationships to each other and trying to ascertain motive, means, and opportunity. So it has felt very strange because my background is not investigative. Um, So that's where the experience with Billy has been really, really eye-opening. But effectively, we started with any names that had been mentioned in the course of the sort of two days leading up to unmasking William Rag, including everybody we had spoken to, because they had clearly been involved in this. And so we didn't want to rule anything out Mm. without evidence. So we sort of wanted to treat everyone who was targeted, as well as who'd heard anything about it, as knowing something that we didn't yet know ourselves. First of all, I think one of the questions we asked ourselves was, who wasn't targeted? If there was somebody who wasn't, did that suggest that they themselves might have been the perpetrator? Mm. I think we decided in the end, that Westminster was such a big place that just because they weren't targeted, it would probably leave too big a pool of people to look at. Did you know the phone numbers that had been making these WhatsApp messages? Or well, you've got those profile pictures. I mean, wh- where do you go? They were the two primary pieces of evidence, which Billy was much more au okay fait with. But the mobile numbers, he was able to run checks on and see where they were registered. He quickly found out, actually, that on a website which people can report scam calls to, the two phone numbers had previously had complaints registered that they were effectively a sort of sex scam and naming Charlie and Abby as the people behind it. And some of those reports go back around a year. So there are questions about whether or not this was Westminster specific and actually it was something that previously just normal people were targeted by and Mm. then the person behind Charlie or Abby cottoned on to a a Westminster specific contact or network and decided to exploit that and has been for at least six months and then we had the pictures and we went to a, a huge amount of effort to try and track down the people in those because there were seeming to be basically three pictures in all of this number one Charlie's WhatsApp profile picture which featured him and uh, a woman opposite him having dinner on a beach. Mm. Another picture that Charlie had sent of his face in a nightclub to try to encourage people to believe that it was his true identity. And then there was a third picture of this woman, Abby, which featured a woman with her sort of face artfully turned away from the camera in a blue dress, pictured outside the ruins of an abbey. We discovered where the Abbey picture was taken, but her face was turned away, so it was almost impossible to do anything with. And then the other two pictures of Charlie, we were more successful in trying to track down the source of those. And tell me about that. So after a lot of legwork, our end, we had a very helpful tip-off from one of my original sources who found a social media profile of the person who it appeared to be that was a much easier launch pad to be able to then find out more about this person, who they were, and whether or not they were themselves the perpetrator or somebody who had had their identity stolen and who was themselves a victim. So this would certainly appear to be a case of identity fraud with the photos being stolen and used by the scammer. Exactly. We were able to access a lot of information about them publicly including lots of photos. And it was only after the Times contacted both of these people that attempts were made to try and reduce that online presence. And they clearly realised the the risk of having all these kind of images and lists of Uh. friends online. The man whose photo has been used has shut down some of his accounts after being contacted by the Times. 
We should just say again, there is no evidence that these people even knew about the scam or know the scammer necessarily. Their pictures have just been taken to be used in the WhatsApp messages. What else have you managed to find out about the person who was behind it? Because you have uncovered more evidence that links them to the world of politics. It appears as though the person masquerading as Charlie and Abby did genuinely have some insight into Westminster, its networks, and how party politics operates far away from London, even extending to the party conference trails. One of those I spoke to was a senior Labour politician who was targeted at Labour conference. I spoke to other Labour staffers who were targeted at Labour conference and said that this Charlie figure was trying to engage them in conversations about who they'd slept with and whether they might want to threesome. So this targeting is clearly done with some knowledge and Westminster is really rife with speculation about how close to home this all gets and whether somebody who was close to Will Rag or maybe even not necessarily close to Will Rag was preying on their fellow colleagues in the Westminster estate. And there is some evidence around the apps that they were using. So so Grindr, one of these gay dating apps, you can sort of tell where they are in relation to the people they're talking to. What did you learn from that? It's very hard because effectively when Charlie deleted his Grindr profile, that deleted all information gathered at both ends. So Mm. people then no longer were able to check their records of when they spoke to him, timings, what messages he sent, what times of day he was more likely to be active. Tracing the sort of Grindr profile is quite tricky, although people that we spoke to at Labour conference said that they were fairly convinced he was nearby. Charlie also apparently referred to being at a convention stall and making sort of frustrated comments about his boss ringing to check work-related stuff. So he was certainly giving the impression that he was there. Labour insiders I've spoken to have checked for some of the names that we think might belong to the genuine perpetrator. And so far, it doesn't look as though anybody was accredited under those names. But as has been pointed out, you don't have to be inside the conference zone, the secure zone where you have to be vetted and accredited by the political party in order to be within a couple of hundred metres of all of these people who are on their phones. Conference is a very social time. I mean, it's very stressful. Mm. And you are kind of up working morning, noon and night. But certainly in the evenings, there's a much more social element to it. And there are plenty of people who do go on these sorts of apps while they're there. And we've been told that this isn't suspected to be a state actor. We don't think this is Russia or China. We have had various scandals recently where it looks like people have been targeted by one or the other country. This isn't that as far as we know. It's not believed to be. Senior people in government don't believe that it is. The spooks don't seem to think that it is. And in some of the interactions with victims, they also don't think it smacks of a sort of industrial scale targeting by a hostile foreign government or people working for them. One of the examples that was given to me was when people were challenging Charlie and saying that they knew what he was up to, that he acted like basically a scared little boy. In his messages, he seemed to backpedal and apologise and say, I'm going to go dark, I'm going to go quiet, I'm going to stop, I'm going to block everything. And they didn't think that a hostile foreign state government or people working for them would quite so easily be sort of talked down by the threat of going to the police because Mm. that's just a quite natural reaction. But we still don't know for sure. And Aubrey, the police are investigating now, so we'll hopefully know more definitively quite soon if you don't get there first. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, I mean, what consequences do you think there'll be for for any of the politicians who are involved, who, who were contacted and might have replied... I think there are going to be wider questions about whether or not you can ever really guard against this in future. Mm. Because there are so many interested parties who would seek to try and stop something like this happening again. You've got the police, you've got the parliamentary security services, you've got the government whips, you've got the spooks. And it almost feels like no matter how much 
guidance or regulation you put in place can you ever really fully guard against basic human error? Somebody thinking with their pants. What made this story so unique was that sense of embarrassment and to a certain extent shame because people who'd been contacted by this unknown person didn't want to confide in either their colleagues or journalists that they had potentially been taken in by this person. The, the number of people I've spoken to who said they really preyed on my vulnerabilities or my insecurities, I didn't think that a person as attractive as that would be interested in me and they showed me attention. They said that they were attracted to me. All of those things were used to manipulate the people at the heart of this story who were the politicians. It's just not clear that if this happened again, it could be stopped in its entirety. That was the chief political correspondent at The Times, Aubrey Allegretti. And if you want to follow this investigation as the story develops, you can find it all at thetimes.co.uk with a subscription. The producers today were Chris Wade and Taryn Siegel. The executive producer was Edward Drummond. And sound design was by Mal Lissetto. If you can, please do leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to get in touch with us, do drop us a line to the story at thetimes.co.uk. Thanks for listening. See you tomorrow. <laughs>